at the Robert H. Smith Faculty of Agriculture, Food, and Environment, which was established in 1942. The faculty has been a major contributor to the settlement of Israel and the development of its remarkable achievements in agriculture. The faculty is also the leading academic authority in Israel for food and nutrition, and its impact can be felt worldwide. Welcome to the greenhouse of the future. This isn't like the typical greenhouse that you have maybe in your backyard. Here we use state-of-the-art technology, such as sensors that measure all aspects of plant lives. This advanced greenhouse is specially designed to allow researchers to screen hundreds of plants simultaneously under a variety of controlled conditions while they continually monitor several physiological parameters for each individual plant. We're here at the Benjamin Trewax Bee Research Center, our hub for the study of the biology of honeybees and bees as pollinators. Welcome to the Fish Research Facility, where scientists learn how to breed fish that are disease resistant. Aquaculture is the fastest growing animal farming sector, addressing the demands for nutritious and healthy foods to feed the world's growing population, especially in developing countries. Here we are at one of the few cannabis-growing research facilities in all of Israel. Using state-of-the-art technologies, our researchers are currently using sensors to measure the plant's environmental variables, including water, temperature, humidity, pH levels, and more. Behind me is the faculty's International School of Agricultural Sciences, which is dedicated to the spreading of its knowledge and expertise with the international community. Just a short drive from campus is the Joseph Margolis Experimental Farm. This is where researchers and students conduct experiments on the growth of fruits, vegetables, and ornamentals. Looks good, huh? Can I tell you, this is actually the only place in Israel where you can get a master's in winemaking and vineyard growing. Now that's what I call an education. Here, in the Phytochan, you can hear the large fans that are going on behind me because what is happening is that we are actually in a sophisticated greenhouse that has the precise means of controlling the environment. It's divided into four climate and light control rooms, so it's summer and winter and spring and fall all at the same time here. Very close to the Rehovot campus is the Hebrew University Veterinary Hospital, which is the only teaching veterinary hospital in all of Israel. Great time hanging out with you today. Hope to see you really soon. Bye. Buenos días a todos los participantes de este evento. Soy Héctor Sussman, presidente de Amigos Argentinos de la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén, y les doy la bienvenida en este nuestro primer evento, La Agricultura del Futuro. En esta oportunidad, Startups, Agrotech y Transgenia. Han visto ustedes en la filmación un rápido pantallazo de lo que es la historia y el presente de la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén en la Facultad de Agronomía y Veterinaria. Han visto ustedes investigación, estudios, formación académica. Pero en esta oportunidad y como este primer evento, eh, destacamos e incorporamos en este espacio a ISUM. ISUM es una empresa de la Universidad Hebrea que se ocupa de la incubación de la investigación la transferencia de tecnología y el desarrollo de las patentes de las invenciones que surgen de los claustros de la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén. ¿Por qué hacemos esto? Porque esta es nuestra manera de mostrar en un mismo evento cómo se estructura y se pasa de la investigación a la implementación. Queremos resaltar la agroindustria, las startups, el desarrollo de nuevas tecnologías, y por eso es que presentaremos también en este seminario dos casos exitosos de la actividad privada, dos casos exitosos que incubó ISUM y que serán presentados por dos exalumnos de la universidad. Por otra parte, 
En el día de mañana seremos partícipes de situaciones similares generadas en la Argentina. Investigadores del CONICET y empresas privadas desarrollando tecnología. Seguramente trataremos temas polémicos, pero lo mejor que podemos hacer es instalarlos, es plantearlos, es insertarlos en la comunidad científica y en la sociedad para su discusión. Quiero agradecer en esta oportunidad a todos los que nos han dado su apoyo para llevar este evento adelante. Agradezco a la Embajada de Israel en la Argentina, a Isum, a Pigmentum, a Futura Jean, a Bioceres, a la Universidad del Litoral, a Usema, a Mitre y el Campo, al ingeniero Vilela, todos ellos por su apoyo y su disposición para participar, y especialmente a la firma Adama, cuya traducción del hebreo es tierra, por ser el sponsor oficial en este evento. A lo largo de estos dos días tendrán ustedes las exposiciones por parte de Israel, de los doctores Ila Pitel, Mirón Abramson y Tal Lusky, y por la experiencia argentina la doctora Raquel Chan y el doctor Claudio Dunan, a quienes agradezco su participación. Y para finalizar con los agradecimientos, uno muy grande a María Eugenia Estensoro por moderar el día de hoy, al ingeniero Daniel Tawil, mentor de este evento, y al equipo profesional de los amigos argentinos por el trabajo desarrollado para llevarlo adelante. No es solamente mandar un mail con un Zoom, hay un gran trabajo detrás de una actividad como esta. La Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén es la única universidad del Estado de Israel que cuenta con una facultad de agronomía y veterinaria. La investigación en Israel trascendió las fronteras del Estado. Los sistemas de irrigación, el cuidado del agua, el tomate cherry, son algunos de los hitos que le han dado fama en el mundo. Pero no terminan allí los avances. La generación de sobreproducción en las mismas áreas cultivadas, la ictiología, la hidroponía, la genética, la conservación de la humedad en las cosechas, etcétera, etcétera, son parte de su investigación y de su aplicación. Por otra parte, en la Argentina, el desarrollo tecnológico, la calidad de sus profesionales y la tecnología en el tratamiento del suelo, en la explotación, la siembra y la cosecha, hacen de Argentina también un líder en el mundo. Indudablemente, como ya lo dije en otra oportunidad donde se dio el tema de Argentina e Israel, estas dos potencias actuando juntas en el tema de la agronomía podrían ser un gran aporte a la humanidad para paliar el hambre en el mundo. Ciencia y conocimiento actuando juntos. Este es el motivo por el que damos inicio, inicio a este ciclo de la agricultura del futuro. Mirar para las nuevas generaciones impulsar proyectos y llevarlos adelante como solución para nosotros en la Argentina y para otras naciones que lo necesiten. Israel, la Startup Nation por excelencia, ayudando e intercambiando con lo más reconocido de la ciencia argentina. Amigos, los invito a participar. Los invitamos a invertir con nosotros a través de nuestros desarrollos. Potencian sus empresas y organizaciones. Es una propuesta win-win para ambas partes. No duden en acercarse y profundizar en todo lo que tenemos para ofrecer. Hay más de 270 tecnologías en Isum, 32 solamente en el área de la agricultura. Vengan, participen. El futuro está en el intercambio con los líderes del mundo y esas son las puertas que es nuestra intención abrir. Gracias por su participación y espero que al terminar este simposio en el día de mañana se hayan generado nuevos lazos entre Argentina e Israel. Quiero dejar ahora la palabra a una amiga de los amigos argentinos a la embajadora del Estado de Israel en la Argentina, la doctora Galit Ronen. Gracias Galit por estar presente hoy con nosotros.
muy amable. Eh, si ustedes saben, yo estoy en plena mudancia. Si no fuese por Héctor, yo había decidido, eh, pedido que sea mi vice que se habla con ustedes, eh, aún que es un evento muy importante y creo que es, eh, siempre estoy hablando de las eh, que, que me mandaron aquí para mejorar las relaciones entre los países y la, el intercambio académico eh, y también el intercambio que ojalá va a enriquecer eh, un win-win, como Héctor bien dijo, es lo que queremos hacer. Y esta es una oportunidad excelente de hacerlo. Y estoy muy agradecida a, a, a Héctor, a los amigos de la Universidad de Ibrea, a Marisa, a todos ustedes que están aquí. Y espero que no solo sea académico, que al final va a salir algo, como decimos nosotros, que hay tajles, hay, que vamos al bife, que sale algo, algún intercambio actual, un mejoramiento de, del sector agropecuario argentino, eh, algo así, pero igual creo que este sería muy valioso para todos los participantes, tanto los israelíes como los argentinos, y le deseo eh, buena suerte y que no sea el último, que solo se le sea el primero. Es muy importante lo que van a decir el ISO, pues es un modelo que sería bueno también para Argentina, creo que sería, podría servir a la Argentina también. Estamos en la embajada, siempre abierto a cualquier forma de cooperación. Héctor, que lo sabes, Marisa también. A todos ustedes, bienvenidos y que disfruten. Toda rabá. Muchas gracias. Bueno, buenos días. Eh, yo he tenido la fortuna, hoy tengo la fortuna de coordinar este panel, que me parece eh, sumamente importante para la Argentina, si bien somos un país líder en producción de alimentos, esta agricultura del futuro de la que vamos a hablar hoy es una agricultura bastante más sofisticada que la que ha visto la humanidad hasta ahora, eh, porque es un verdadero eh, matrimonio entre los científicos, las universidades, el conocimiento y los productores agropecuarios, y donde el campo ya no solamente produce alimentos, sino como seguramente vamos a ver, todo tipo de eh, sustancias, enzimas, eh, mate, eh, eh, bacterias, eh, todo tipo de, de organismos, moléculas, para mejorar los procesos, no solamente de la agricultura, sino industriales. El, el campo como una fábrica verde, eh, donde el conocimiento ya no está en las grandes ciudades, sino que en realidad está en esta asociación de las universidades y el campo, y es un paso que para la Argentina, eh, que tiene un sistema científico de gran calidad y tiene las mejores tierras del mundo, conocer más de estos procesos y hacer una alianza con Israel, eh, me parece que sería maravilloso, porque el proceso del que vamos a ver hoy, del laboratorio científico al mercado, es un proceso que lo llaman el valle de la muerte, no es fácil ir de la universidad, al, al mercado, al campo, al mercado. Y eso es lo que en este primer, eh, mi primer panelista, Ilia nos va a Patel, que es el director de desarrollo de negocios de Gizum, la empresa de transferencia tecnológica de la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén, nos va a explicar cómo se hacen estas asociaciones entre los investigadores de la facultad y la industria, la industria de Actec, de food tech, de ciencias veterinarias, de ciencias ambientales. Este es un proceso que en la Argentina hay algunos casos sobresalientes que van a ver mañana, que vamos a ver mañana, pero que son realmente unos pocos. En cambio, eh, tal vez Israel, que está en medio del desierto y que ha tenido que poner mucho conocimiento para, para toda su industria eh, de Actec, entonces está muy avanzada en esto que es el paradigma del siglo XXI. Así que eh, eh, Ilia Patel es doctor, eh, tiene un doctorado en ciencias, la Universidad de Bar Ilam de Israel, y seguramente fue además también eh, eh, analista comercial de Futura Gene, que es un startup del cual hablaremos más adelante, y dirige, está en el directorio de tres eh, empresas que fueron eh, empresas incubadas eh, 
Nisum. Entonces vamos a poder entender todo este proceso que como les decía en la Argentina tenemos grandes científicos, grandes productores rurales y emprendedores, pero a veces es un rompecabezas que no está conectado y que eh, hoy tenemos la suerte por esta iniciativa de la Universidad de Hebrea de Jerusalén, de los exalumnos, eh, de poder mostrarnos cómo es este modelo en acción que puede generar eh, tanta riqueza y tanto trabajo y oportunidades para la Argentina y la agricultura del futuro. Así que, Ilia, um, we would like to hear you now, uh, so you can tell us how this transference from from uh, you know the university lab to the industry to place, uh, which is a very uh, uh, unique process and delicate. So we are eager to hear you. Great. Hello. Hi. Can can you hear and see me? Yes, we can see you very well. <clears throat> Excellent. So let me put on my uh, presentation. Uh, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Excellent. So thank you very much, Maria, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ilya Patel, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Yisum. At Yisum. Um, and I'm in charge of the ag tech, food tech, environmental space. And we have about 100, we have about 100 researchers at the Faculty of Agriculture. And it's my job to help facilitate the collaboration with the industry uh, very, with various mechanisms that we'll uh, explore uh, through sponsored research, services, licensing, and I'll go into a little bit of detail uh, about that. So just a little bit on the agenda, what I want to present. <clears throat> so just one slide about um, the ecosystem and uh, government support, um, a little bit about Hebrew University itself, so we know what we're discussing because it's uh, critical uh, to understand technology transfer. Um, you assume a little bit about our history, our partnership models, and our venture uh, funds, and then, <clears throat> and then we'll look at last year's uh, spin-out companies. <clears throat> so, uh, part of the success of the Israeli ecosystem is really attributed to the Israeli government. Uh, it nurtures this uh, innovation by providing grants to scientists, uh, investors, and companies. Uh, we have various industry agencies and ministries. The Israel Innovation Indus Authority is a, <clears throat> is a government agency that has a great deal of influence on the innovation by providing uh, $1.7 billion annually to the ecosystem, to the innovation system, um, supporting um, over 1,600 innovative projects and uh, over 1,000 companies as well as uh, training boot camps, for example, for the low socioeconomic uh, households, providing them with uh, programming uh, boot camps. So the, the Israel government uh, is doing a lot to sponsor innovation and it goes a long way to helping uh, the university, different university projects and the collaborations with companies and investors. So, um, a little bit about Hebrew University. Hebrew University was uh, started in 1925. It's a long uh, institution that was envisioned uh, e even 70 years before the start of Israel in 1882. Um, nowadays, uh, we have about 25,000 students here, six campuses. We have about 1,400 researchers. Um, and the Faculty of Agriculture is one of them. It's located in Rehovot as the nice video uh, before me uh, showed. Um, it was started in 1942, and we have about 2,300 students there now, so about 10% of the population. Uh, Hebrew University is famous for uh, around the world. It has about eight Nobel, has eight Nobel Prizes um, and hundreds of uh, Israel Prizes. Um, it has uh, has won medals and prestigious awards in mathematics, computer sciences, medical sciences, and, and many others. So it's a really, it's a tier one uh, university uh, recognized around the world. We have uh, six, seven different multidisciplinary research centers. In fact, this slide has six, but we have a seventh that just didn't fit. I have to talk to our PR uh, department about that. So we have in cannabis research, cybersecurity centers, bioengineering, 
um, nanosciences, nanotechnologies, genetics, uh, stem cell research, and uh, functional uh, 3D and functional printing center. We also have the one that didn't fit is the brain sciences slide uh, center that deals with bioengineering as well. So the, the uh, Reuters has has um, ranked Hebrew University as one of the in the top 100 most innovative universities, and also PitchBook has rated Hebrew University in the top 50 of the venture-backed uh, companies, uh, universities of venture backing. So now well, we get to the crux of the matter, which is the uh, Yisum technology transfer. So Yisum was uh, founded in 1964. It is a company that is fully owned by the Hebrew University. And it was one of the original one. It's one of the, the third that was established uh, around the world that does, deals with university technology transfer. It, we are the exclusive owners of all intellectual property uh, owned by, that is invented at Hebrew University. So that means any patents or know-how that are created by graduate students or faculty members are automatically owned by Yisum. Um, and, then it, and then basically it's our job to bring these new inventions to the industry. So we're bridging the gap uh, between the two worlds of academia and industry. And we sit in between on that, uh, on that, in that threshold between the two worlds of industry and academia. And we try to facilitate uh, various commercial opportunities, creating translational innovation. So we do this through various uh, partnership models. Um, we have uh, research and option licenses. So that basically means that a company can sponsorship research at the university at a particular lab and get an option to take a license to that, to the results or patents and know-how that results from their sponsorship. We also have research services um, that don't deal with new intellectual property. It's more data-driven. So if a company would like one of our researchers to do some sort of test and receive data, so we have a, a research service agreement for that purpose. Sometimes companies have trouble um, have trouble within their own research research labs and need outside help, so they can come to our professors and ask them to help them solve some sort of an issue that they have. And so we have a request for proposals that they can put out. And, and sometimes it's a multidisciplinary problem and needs uh, input from a variety of researchers. So we're able to put together a team of researchers that will help to solve this company's particular problem. And we do this through a request for proposals and then they sponsorship research at the, at the labs. And afterwards we can license to them the different, the IP and know-how that's in, in invented um, as a result of that research. Uh, we leverage different government, uh, both national and international grants to help fund the research. Uh, we also, do spin-off companies, and we'll get into that a little bit later, some examples. And both uh, Fraturgy and, um, and Pigmentum, which, which are, you know, which are also speaking after me, are also came from Hebrew University and are based on some research that was, research that was done at uh, Hebrew University. We also have master collaborations with strategic partners. Um, sometimes in, in various geographies, we have a strategic partner that act as a you know, long distance uh, arm to help us to, to uh, license and commercialize those technologies. And we also have two venture funds inside uh, Yisum that were st started by Yisum that helped to um, fund specific um, research at the university and to help bring it to market. So one of them is called Integra Holdings and that they are focused on therapeutics, medical devices, and diagnostics. We're very strong, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, we're very strong in the medical field. Um, and we have the Rakach Nanotech Fund that, that sponsors research and makes creates spin-out companies uh, based on uh, advanced materials and nanotechnologies. 
So over the last 57 years of uh, transferring technology, um, we have almost 11,000 patents at Isum. Over 1,000 licenses have been uh, given out and over 190 spin-off companies have been created. I think about 117 are still uh, in existence nowadays. If we look at um, last year, which we thought was going to be a very slow year because of the corona outbreak, the COVID-19 outbreak, we in fact were pre pleasantly surprised to have a very strong year and we had um, over 90 license agreements signed um, and almost 140 sponsorship uh, and research agreements signed. We had over 100, we had 120 patents filed, new patents filed just in 2020 and 17 spin-out companies were formed. So uh, these are the 17 spin-out companies that were formed. Um, the ones here on the left side, Rumafeed, Biomilk, Cropsguard, Kinoko, as well as Prevera on the right-hand side over here, were all from the agricultural faculty um, at in Rehoboth. So again, if you look at uh, 2020, um, all the different agreements by, by different faculties, we see that the Faculty of Agriculture over here in orange um, it has about 20% of the, of the whole, um, of all the agreements that are signed at, the, at Yisum, um, which, which deal with different industry partners. And if we look at the intellectual property portfolio that we have, so about 60% of that portfolio is from life sciences and biotechnology. And after that, we have about 17% coming from agriculture, food and nutrition sciences. So that's about, that shows you that, that the life science, biotechnology, medical field is very, very strong at Hebrew University, but ag tech and food tech are, are falling closely behind. We even have some uh, patents inside the humanities and social sciences, which is which pretty, pretty rare for a, for a university. We have, um, we're lucky to have actually four blockbuster or unicorns um, technologies that have made more than a billion uh, dollars. So the latest one is Mobileye, which is an advanced driver assistance system providing warning and for collision prevention and mitigation. And that was sold to Intel for $15.3 billion and is actually the largest exit in Israel's history. We have uh, the Exelon, which is a, a drug that for relieving symptoms of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. That was sold to Novartis for $1 billion in 2013. We have uh, Doxo, which is a liposomal chemotherapeutic chemother drug. It holds about 50% of the market's market share and sells annually about $200 million. And so to date, it's sold uh, over one and a half billion dollars worth of product. And the cherry tomatoes that we're all familiar with and eat on a daily basis were bred you know, had the breeding done at uh, the Faculty of Agriculture uh, to basically to extend the shelf life and to prevent the, 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 the tomatoes from, from cracking. Because once they're cracked, then you can't uh, sell them anymore. So the breeding was done many, many years ago and has been incorporated into all the different cherry tomatoes. So that genetics has been incorporated into the genetics of all the tomatoes that we eat nowadays. So if we take a look at the, the, our ag tech, food tech portfolio, so it's quite complex actually because there are many, many different fields that fall underneath it. So we have, for example, breeding um, that could be in various uh, fruits and vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, garlic, potatoes. Uh, we have ag biotech, which is genetic modification of crops and different platform technologies. Um, like eucalyptus we'll hear from here on, um, flowers, uh, peppers, tomatoes, um, and we'll, we'll hear also from Talutsky about pigmentium. Uh, we have the ag tech equipment, hyperspectral analysis, greenhouse uh, technologies that we saw in the vid little video beforehand. Um, we have greenhouse uh, bug zappers, which uh, to help prevent flying mites inside the greenhouses and it's a spin out we, we just made and it'll be on the next slide. Um, ag tech plant protections, different slow release formulations of peptides, RNAi, different advanced technologies. 
We have uh, veterinary med and medicines. So for animal mood assessments, dental and skeletal improvements, and even identification of bushmeat for the one that's being sold illegally into Europe. Uh, environmental technologies for water purification, biodegradable packaging solutions are, are good examples. Uh, different sensor technologies um, that can sense volatiles like an electronic nose to analyze post-harvest wastes, wine spoilage, um, different uh, human fertility biosensors or, or urine tract infections. Those are some examples of things that we have available now or that being developed at uh, ag uh, faculty. Different food technologies like texturization of food, uh, shape-shifting pasta, high-strength uh, jelly shots, and digital, digital gastronomy, which is, which is a, its own ecosystem of understanding. Uh, we have also fish technologies, growth enhancers, vaccines, antibacterial agents, virus-resistant fish, and different, fil different filter filtering techniques. So there's a really a, a, a plethora of different technologies and lots of things, cutting-edge technologies that are being developed at the agricultural faculty and together make a rainbow of, of in, in innovation. And, uh, and I think we have time for uh, one more slide uh, as my time is, is running out. Um, we have, these are the uh, five spin-out companies that were created just last year. Um, so Prevera is developing solutions for eliminating microbial contamination by utilizing antimicrobial peptides that are easy to incorporate into a variety of applications in the water, food packaging, and beverage industries. We have Rumafeed, and the company has developed uh, potato plants uh, that without, without the solanine uh, toxin, which can be fed to animals to help uh, increase feed uh, cat for cattle production. So usually, um, when we have potatoes and, and the green parts of it actually are toxic when we're not supposed to be eating those. So all the plants and leaves above the ground are toxic and they're usually just left in the, in, in, you know, to degrade as natural fertilizer. But now with this new innovation, it can be actually used as feed for cattle. Uh, the next one, Biomilk. So Biomilk develops in vitro systems for producing bovine and human milk. Uh, protein, lactose, and fat in cultured mammary cells. So what they're basically doing is, is growing or producing milk in a laboratory. Um, and right now it's on small scale, but there was a lot of hype and this company actually went public in Israel this past year as well. We were able to spin out and take it public. And now um, the, the idea is to develop not only uh, cow milk, in, in, but eventually to, to tailor make human milk. So instead of having, you know, feeding a baby powdered milk from a cow, it can be a human-like uh, milk that's being uh, developed for the baby. Uh, oops. We have uh, Kinoko, um, which is, offers a new mushroom-based high-quality non-allergenic alternative protein with desired uh, meat-like texture and umami. And we have CropsGuard, which I started to tell you about before that zaps bugs. So it uses radio frequency as a means to, for pest control inside the greenhouse and allows crops to be uh, grown insect insecticide free. So you don't have to spray the crops anymore. There's a special electronic uh, radio frequency that, that, that is able to, to push them away. So I can stop here or we can continue depending on how much time we have. Maria, how much time uh, do we have left? No, you, 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 you can, well, if you are ready to close, but you have a couple of minutes still. Okay, so why don't I do one more, one more slide. Um, we have a professor by the name of Oded Shosayo um, that is, has, is a serial, uh, serial entrepreneur, you can call him, researcher and entrepreneur. And he has spun out many companies um, and I'd like to go over a few of them. So actually the first one is Peturgine. So I'll leave for Miron to explain what Peturgine does. So I'll skip to the next one. And that's uh, coal plants, which develops uh, plant-based collagen for regener regenerative, me regenerative medicine products. 
So inside the inside plants, they're able to create collagen, which is usually comes from animals, and and that's used in many a, a variety of different products. Gamma cert um, is a little as a little uh, tool, a little um, a machine, in which you can put inside the flower of the cannabis and and see what the potential for its uh, CBD and THC, and this is non-destructive. To date, you can to find out the strength of the of the cannabis. You'd have to destroy the sample, but this machine is able to do it without destroying the sample. Uh, Smart Resilin is developing new strong and elastic composite materials made from elastomeric proteins found in insects, which is bound to a cellulose binding protein. And this material, this new composite can be used in various applications, in hair strengthening, touch screen, televisions, uh, high performance adhesives, and uh, even sneakers. Uh, BioBetter uh, has a platform that simplifies and reduces the cost of protein manufacturing and purification of biological drugs. Um, the first drug is an antibody based uh, in the, in, for, for an array of inflammatory conditions. And the last one I'll talk to you about today um, is Melodea, which develops an innovative uh, cellulose, nano, cellulose nanocrystalline based oxygen barrier solutions for the liquid packaging industry. And this is extracted from trees and plants and it makes Melodea's products completely recyclable, uh, compostable and biodegradable. And the first application is using this in barrier solutions, like in, um, in replacing the aluminum lining of drink juice boxes. Right now, drink juice boxes have aluminum inside and they can't recycle them. And Melodea would like to replace them with this recyclable uh, natural material called CNC or cellulose nanocrystalline. So I think I think I have a few more slides, but I think that would be enough for now. Yeah. And anybody that's interested can, can always get in touch with me and I'll put them in touch with the various companies that we have at Pisa. Wonderful, Ilya. This was uh, really a, a very broad and uh, uh, panorama of, of what uh, this uh, marriage between science and, uh, and the production of, of uh, all kinds of, of products of, that, that, are, that come from, uh, from farming but in a very uh, different way of the farming that the kibbutz, you know, I was thinking when we would go to Israel to see the kibbutz, and this is really another, another world. And yes. so thank you very much because it's opening uh, our eyes for, for many of us. And now we will introduce our second speaker, Dr. Miron Abramson. Uh, Miron has a, a, a also tiene también un perdón un doctorado en uh, arte que es doctor en filosofía es, es doctor en, en filosofía en PhD con especialización en biotecnología de la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén y si bien él se ha especializado en eh, ciencias de la vida biotecnología es un científico de alto nivel ahora dirige la empresa eh, Futura Gene, que se especializa en, eh, en procesos de mejora de los procesos de la, de la madera. Ahora él nos va a explicar, pero este, también esta simbiosis entre la ciencia y la dirección de una empresa que es eh, muy interesante lo que dice, es una plataforma de cultivo de tejidos y calidad de madera. Uh, um, Miron, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I was saying how you are a very qualified scientist, but that now you have a different role, which is uh, leading a company. Um, and uh, so we would like to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. So my name is Miron Abramson. I am the director of the tissue culture and wood quality in Futurogen. I'm also a proud alumni of the Hebrew University and the past colleague of Ilya. Um, I will talk about the forest industry and um, new challenges and developments that we've developed and other in the world. I personally think that this is a subject is sometimes a footnote in many conferences and discussions. And there are many that are not familiar with the size and importance of 
this industry for our everyday life. So if you look at the wood industry, um, we have three main products uh, that we, we produce right now from, uh, from wood. One is wood for construction. The other is fiber. And we produce uh, printing and writing, uh, uh, fiber for printing and writing, fiber for packaging, fiber for tissue paper, uh, toilet paper, hygiene products, and energy. This is very basic for our everyday life. And this is coming uh, on top of what we call the plantation forestry. So if we look at the whole type of wood in the world, natural wood, plantation forestry, only 7% is plantation forest, a forest that we plant for the industry. And it provides 50% of the roundwood demand for all the products that we saw earlier. Much tinier are eucalyptus plantations, which is 0.5% of the world wood uh, produced. But it produces 10% or provide 10% of the demand of wood, which means that eucalyptus is uh, highly productive, more, more efficient, mainly compared to the pine trees and the softwood trees that we have in the Northern Hemisphere. So we're going to talk about this tree and the industry around it. Susano, our main company, um, is now the biggest of its kind uh, following the historical merge between Fibria, that was the largest uh, pulp producer in, in Brazil and South America, and Susana. We have around 1.5 million hectares of planted and certified areas. Just to give you a, a measure, um, the size of Israel is 2 million hectares, uh, more or less. So this is really huge area. All of it planted with eucalyptus. We produce almost 11 million tons of market pulp uh, in seven pulp mill, as you can see here, all over Brazil. Uh, and we produce uh, 1.5 million tons of paper for domestic use. This is just to show you the large uh, difference between Susano and the main uh, competitors, such as uh, APP from Indonesia, Stora Enso, UPM, etc. The scale of eucalyptus plant plantations and industries is large. It's, it's very similar to any other agricultural crop that we, we regularly to see. Um, here you can see some nurseries. You can see the beautiful mosaic plantation, which not many are familiar with. We'll talk about this wood in between. What's, what's the meaning of it? And here it, how, here it, how it looks after uh, harvesting. So another interesting uh, uh, point to, to mention is that uh, the industry is negative carbon balance. We invest or the trees harness more carbon, sequester more carbon uh, than we invest uh, in terms of uh, fertilization, planting, fuel, uh, 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 pulp mills production and shipments of the product. So this is very important uh, to note. Uh, in the following picture, we can see uh, a soil that uh, cannot be used to grow agricultural crops, but we plant eucalyptus on top of this uh, uh, soil, and we reserve 30% of the land to restore the natural uh, uh, trees that were there before, uh, many years before. And you can see in the right, the plantation forest, which looks like any other row crop, but in between, and this is the same area that you see in the left picture. In between, you can see the Atlantic forest um, that was extinct many years ago, coming back to life. This is very, uh, I think this is very important for, for all of us to know. Uh, and this is very good for the environment and for uh, our planet. Let's go back to, to the industry itself. So the world is changing. Uh, we are taking taking more steps towards the bioeconomy. Uh, we are living more in cities. Population is growing older and older. Climate is changing. We see now the temperature in North America and in Europe. Uh, and there is much more technology and digitalization and emerging economies like China and every, everywhere uh, the economy is growing. And this should increase 
the use and demand for wood products and renewable products, mainly if you look at, uh, at the bioeconomy, uh, renewable solutions for packaging, tissues, textile, reduced plastic use, alumi aluminum use, as uh, Ilya uh, described earlier, and also carbon capture, which is very important for our uh, planet. I'm going to talk about two uh, interesting products uh, that our uh, new products are going to, to do a shift from plastic and aluminum towards wood-based and renewable-based uh, products. Ilya was talking about uh, Melodia, which is a Hebrew university uh, based uh, or spin off of the Hebrew university. It produces uh, nanocrystalline cellulose. Cellulose is mainly produced uh, from trees. This is the most common uh, uh, material on earth. It is a very simple polymer comprised only of glucose. Uh, but with certain modification, we can produce a, a, a product that is called microfibrillated cellulose, uh, which is stronger than steel. Here you can see in the picture, 1% of this material, it forms a gel, it can capture a lot of water, and it can use it as a thickening agent uh, uh, for the uh, cosmetic industry. It can increase the wet strength uh, of uh, packaging and also reduce the weight. So reduce also the cost of transportation. Um, as it is very strong, it can use in, in, in construction and in insulators uh, inside our homes and replacement of aluminums for uh, packaging. So Susanna, our company also develop uh, in parallel to Melodia, this kind of product. Another solution is uh, a solution for textile. Cotton is very polluting uh, and use a lot of water and eucalyptus use around 1% of the water that is needed to produce the same amount of cotton. So uh, Spanish, uh, sorry, a Finnish company named Spinova had an idea that utilized, again, nanocellulose, uh, but use very similar extrusion mechanism as uh, the spider uh, used to, to make its, uh, its spider silk. Uh, so instead of uh, harsh chemicals and a lot of water that used to produce uh, uh, textile from cotton, we are now producing textile from eucalyptus uh, Susano invested around 30% of uh, Spinova. You can see that uh, following a, the development of a pilot plant, we're now also producing a fabric. And this is a major breakthrough for the bioeconomy. But this is not enough. In order to support everything, we need a lot of wood. And the demand of wood is going to double itself by 2030. Uh, but we don't have another planet Earth. We have only one. So this is where Futurogen is coming uh, into place. Uh, we are a plant biotechnology company. Uh, we were founded in 1993 as a spin-off from the Hebrew University, from Professor Odette Chosev Lab. Um, we are uh, situated in Rehovot, which is next to the campus of the agriculture faculty. We have 105 people, <clears throat> 40 in Israel, 64 in Brazil, one in Spain. Um, and we build up a chain of uh, collaboration all over the world. We take ideas, genes, development of uh, products um, <clears throat> with universities and institutes, many that you know. Uh, and we know how to take a gene or an idea. Uh, some of them we discover, some other, uh, and form a product. Um, we have three technological platforms. One platform is to increase yield, which is biomass, if we talk about eucalyptus. And the other one is to protect the yield from pests, pathogens, diseases. And the last one is to improve wood quality, to reduce chemical demand and increase the productivity of the, of the pulp mills. Uh, if we look at the increased yield, so the first product that we produced uh, actually uh, approved is transgenic product that approved for commercial use in 2015. In, this is the same technology uh, that on its base uh, we build our company. The technology came from the Hebrew University. Um, the whole idea was to express a protein that make the cell grow larger. Um, and it can increase the growth of the trees by around 20%. Uh, 
At the end of the day, it reduced the pressure on natural resources. We can use more la less land for the same amount of wood. We can reduce CO2 emissions for by uh, using less wood and transportation, lower for forest establishment costs, and we call it sustainable intensive intensification. But we are not a one-trick pony. We have another interesting gene that you can see here with a different mode of action. On the, on the right, you can see the conventional or the wild type tree, what we call to its left, the transgenic that grow about 40 to 50% more uh, faster uh, with better wood quality. If we look at a wood quality platform, so again, if you look at wood, wood is like a natural chemical factory. You can produce the cellulose, you can produce the lignin, which is another polymer with uh, unique features. And you can produce from all of it, paper, tissues, hygienes, everything that we talked about earlier, but there is several polymer that hinders all these goods from the trees. And the wood industry use a lot of chemicals to remove these, chemi these uh, hindrance from the tree and to get to the essence to the cellulose itself. So we had a great idea how to modify the wood in a way that will be much easier uh, for it uh, to be uh, degraded in the mill without any impact on its growth, without any impact on uh, uh, its natural resistance compared to uh, uh, resistance from uh, uh, pests and pathogens. We call it lignin zips. And we put uh, like a new monomer of uh, inside the lignin that it's much easier to open up. So we have a unique way to protect uh, our trees against caterpillars. On our right, you can see the wild type tree. To the left, you saw this, the movie how the, the sorry, to the to the left, the wild type tree. To the right, our protected tree with the unique feature uh, that can reduce the chemical usage of uh, pesticides and avoid productivity loss. At the end of the day, there is no solution through classical breeding, only through transgenic. Another interesting project that we have uh, is a humanitarian project together with Danforth uh, Institute. We donated the rights to use the, the gene, the gene uh, that came out from the Hebrew University that to increase yield. And uh, together with them, we put it inside uh, uh, Serateria. Uh, and we were fortunate to see that it caused early maturity of this crop, which can increase the amount of uh, installments in the field, reduce post flowering stress, uh, and really help farmers in, uh, in areas as such in Africa to have more yield and to combat, combat diseases and pests much easier. Uh, this work actually was published a um, few months ago uh, and you can uh, look at it uh, on your spare time. So just to summarize everything, we uh, have an approved uh, GM eucalyptus product, the only one in the world uh, with the commercial feasibility. Our herbicide tolerant eucalyptus, uh, we're going to submit the dossier uh, for the regulatory agencies this year. This is a great achievement also. You saw the insect resistance eucalyptus, which is again unique of its kind and can reduce uh, uh, chemical and pesticides that are used in the field. And the unique lignin modifying technology that is really a transformation from technology in this, uh, in, this, in this world of forestry. Uh, just follow a proof of concept in the field. Um, we have other platforms that we didn't, I didn't discuss today related more, mainly to bioinformatics we identified very interesting genetic markers that against important stress uh, that we see in eucalyptus. And we have identified and sequenced the first epigenome, which is the next layer above the genome uh, of eucalyptus. And I would like to thank you all for listening. Bueno, thank you very much, uh, Miron, it was fascinating. Um, I already have a lot of questions and I'm sure that the, our audience as well. And now I will um, introduce Tal Lutsky, 
who is, uh, es el cofundador, el CEO y cofundador de Pigmentum. Eh, y Pigmentum es una empresa de agrotech, de innovación y empresas emergentes utilizando herramientas moleculares para la producción de ingredientes a gran escala. Ahora Tal nos va a explicar eh, qué significa esto, que como han visto ya eh, el, 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 el campo o, ha dejado de ser, como les decía, la idea que nosotros tenemos, sobre todo en Argentina, de la estancia, sino que son fábricas que producen todo tipo de productos y por suerte amigables al, al medio ambiente. Tal Lutsky es eh, licenciado en ciencias vegetales y tiene una amplia eh, experiencia en el cultivo de plantas ornamentales y la investigación agrícola. Tal, we are very happy to have you here and to to hear what is Pigmentum and another, uh, I think another spin-off of the University of uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So first I'm uh, excited and honored to be here and tell you about Pigmentum, which is my baby and uh, work, work hard on it in the last few years. Uh, so my name is Tal Utsky, I'm co-founder and CEO at Pigmentum. And we are communicating with plants. What does it mean that we communicate with plants? We can tell plants what to do, and more, we can tell them when to do it. And why is that important? Uh, so black carrot, lavender, oranges, vanilla, they all sources for natural ingredients industry, for food, pharma, and cosmetic. And I, I guess you, You maybe know uh, or are familiar with the food industry trend of moving to natural, uh, to natural ingredients instead of synthetic. Uh, the, re the reason for that is mainly due to health perception uh, of natural source ingredients as healthy, healthy sorry, and the synthetic ones is correlated with uh, different diseases, obesity, and uh, another uh, horrible things. Uh, food ingredients divided uh, to three major groups, flavors, fragrance and fragrances, and pigments. And the ingredients market, the all ingredients market is above $30 billion dollars per year. And the natural ingredient sector from it is around $8 billion. Dollar. And like I said, uh, is enjoying is enjoying a positive trend, and for that is expected to grow. Uh, but there is problems. <clears throat> there is major uh, major problems uh, with the with this industry. The first one that I want to speak about is connected to the fact that most of this industry, based on traditional agriculture of dedicated crops, from from which the ingredients is extracted. Uh, that further, further caused a uh, major problem uh, for the companies to create a stable industry and supply throughout the years. And considering the world's climate change uh, and the fact that uh, we, we all understand that agriculture uh, will, go, will go through changes in the near future, Uh, an example for, for instability of agriculture, I can give you uh, the, the oranges, uh, that there's a major disease attacking citrus worldwide, causing a major yield loss and deficiency. And another, another example is the vanilla that grows naturally in specific climate zones. And for producing it in other parts of the world, you will need to invest a fortune on agricultural agrotechnical uh, equipment, sorry. Uh, okay, so I spoke about the trend of moving to natural and the uh, instability or the stability challenges of the industry. But this industry is facing with another not less important trend, which is sustainability. The traditional method uh, and value chain of the production of natural ingredients suffering from inefficiency. And one of the main reasons for that is the low concentration of the desired compounds 
inside the plant's tissue. Uh, if we'll take again the, the orange, uh, for example, for producing one kilogram of orange aroma, uh, of orange aroma compound, we, we would need 2.5 tons of oranges. You can only imagine the, what, what does it means, uh, what, does, what does it means for the high costs comparing to synthetic ingredients and the inefficient extraction process when we get so little from so much weight. Uh, and maybe the, maybe the worst uh, fact, the, the, ma the major amount of organic waste resulting from the process and the inefficient use of agricultural lands and therefore water, chemicals, pesticides, and, and everything that connecting with the agriculture. So uh, all, all these challenges forcing the market to look for white solution that would answer both uh, qu quantita quanti sorry, quantitative uh, issues, such as the low, the low concentration and the effective biomass, but also qualitative issues such as stable supply, adherent, uh, precise and high quality products for a wide range of compounds. Um, there is a available solution today, but they rely mainly on fermentation processes of GM microorganisms. Uh, but, uh, however, as for today, those are expensive solutions and in an industry for, of ingredients and raw materials, the profits are limited and uh, therefore uh, a, more ex a more accessible solution is required. Uh, Pigmentum's development is intended to answer these needs. We created transgenic plants sorry, that functions, functions like small factories or bioreactors ready to produce a desired compound that is equivalent and identical to the existing source in extra high yield, extra high, high yields, sorry, in all the plant cells and organs upon induction. You may think, um, way production of metabolites in transgenic plants has been done for a long time now. Uh, it's true, but we took it one step or maybe three steps forward uh, to the next generation. Our patent protected technology is unique in that we don't use a regular constitutive uh, expression of the genes but we use inducible exp expression that we, we have patent on it. <clears throat> and that is a ve uh, very important fact because compared to the alternative, we got much higher uh, concentrations. We're able to control the timing and for that the environmental conditions in which the compounds will be produced. And our plants gain biomass in high rates and only when the activator is implemented via irrigation or spraying, the plants dedicate all their energy and, metaboli and metabolism toward biosynthetic pathway that pr produce a specific desired compound. What that you see in the picture here is our plants, Pigmentum's plants that one of them was irrigated with the activation serum and the other was brushed with the, acti with the activator on the leaves. And you can see that each cell that came in touch with the, with the activator, starting hyperexpression cascade of anthocyanin in this case, which is a natural pigment used in the f by the food industry and also cosmetic industry from cereals to uh, lipstick. Uh, in this case, it's, it is a pigment, but these days we are adjusting the platform to produce several other uh, ingredients requ required by the industry, and soon it will be vanillin, valencem, protein, or any other desired compounds. Uh, this is our team. Near the end of our first de degree, my partner, Amir Tiroler, uh, and the CTO of the company, uh, with experience in uh, molecular biology and extraction methods, and myself, 
with many years of experience in different agricultural crops, from growing to R&D. We went to Professor uh, Alexander Weinstein from the Robert H. Faculty uh, of Agriculture, who is a world leader in the field of uh, metabolic engineering in plants. Uh, we went with the, with, the technolo with, the, with our technology that based on the fact uh, that every natural compound has a bioche biochemical uh, pathway for its creation inside the plant cell. <laughs> we are using advanced molecular tools to teach our plants. It can be lettuce, for example, to produce a desired compound, and it doesn't matter from uh, which organism. Like we can teach uh, our lettuce to produce uh, uh, material compounds from oranges. Uh, so it not necessarily knows how to do it naturally. And more, we tell him when to do it by a dormant mechanism that can receive our activator, which not found in the final product, and react to it with hyperexpression of desired genes to produce a specific metabolite in extra high yields. We are also avoiding byproducts by silencing unwanted elements in the pathway for obtaining a precise product. Our technology can, uh, can produce nearly any desired compounds in a wide range of plants. Um, okay, so our mechanism advantage are clear. Uh, on the quantitative side, we get the highest content concentration that we found in plants tissue. Our plants gain biomass in higher rates and we are increasing the effective biomass by using the old plants. Uh, our technology offers advantage also on the qualitative side. We can produce wide range of metabolites, including cytotoxic, volatile, and unstable metabolites that can't be produced, or it's very hard to produce in large amounts by using alternative uh, methods. We can control the timing, and for that, we can control the environment in which the metabolites are produced, and therefore we can get adherence and optimize product. Uh, our plants can be easily grown in most part of the world, and also in indoor and vertical farming uh, methods to create stable supply all year round. Uh, finally, our, our method is highly scalable and cost-effective uh, comparing to the alternatives. Um, so the natural ingredients uh, industry has, has a very ordered value chain with a single focal point that controlling it from the seed to the final products. And it is the, the, the big ingredients companies uh, such as IFF, Givo, Dan Cargill that you can see uh, right here. Um, Pigmentum's technology is very, very relevant to them because we offer an analytic white solution for their products and allow them to create stable supplies of quality, uh, of quality products all year round while integrating in the existing value chain without special adjustment. Uh, <clears throat> Pigmentum will sell the unique uh, genetics and the activator to, the, to these companies. And uh, in advance, we will offer development and ad an adjustment service of, uh, of our technology for further products on demand. Our technology, I, I didn't say, is highly fit for ingredients for other industries, not only, not only the food industry, uh, such as pharma and cosmetics, that uh, this uh, same, th these companies are uh, active in, in this market also. Uh, so let me show you the video. <laughs> uh, I tell you, after uh, two years of extensive work uh, at Professor Weinstein's lab at the Hebrew University, we got our POC. And uh, at the begin beginning of the, this year, the current year, we got in fresh start incubator. Uh, upon an investment of $1 million. Uh, this money is allow us, allows us to establish our own lab 
and greenhouse to expand our R&D team and our products portfolio, uh, both plants and compounds, make larger scale pilots and develop the extraction method for each product. And uh, in a year and a half from now, we will be after a successful round, round day and uh, in the market. Uh, I think that's it, this is us. And our goal is to allow uh, better food in good prices for all of us and our children. So uh, I guess we all need it and uh, stay tuned. Thank you, I would love to, to be in touch with everybody. Thank you very much, Tal. It was really uh, <laughs> mind uh, boggling because uh, this idea that you can communicate with plants, which, but also tell them what to do, uh, and to and when, and, and to a lettuce plant to, to tell them to produce com compounds that come from oranges. Well, this is uh, very, uh, very amazing. And uh, thank you to all of, of, of the three speakers. And I have uh, one question for, for um, uh, everybody. What is the importance of patents? Because you all talked about uh, intellectual property and patents. Is, is, is that very important when you develop something to patent it? Um, and, uh, and specifically to, to um, is that does does that it protects your 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 invention and uh, what why do you do it? I, I will start. Okay. <laughs> so I think it depends. I think it depends. I think that everybody will have a different answer. That I'm sure. Um, but if I'm looking at our experience, then. As a young company, we had to protect our rights. That's that's for sure, and this is what probably Tal will look for. Um, now, as a very mature company, we still are, we are writing patents, uh, and the aim is mainly to protect, but also to connect with others uh, that will know what what we are doing, because it is a way also to pub publish your work in a way for the other other industrial partners to see what you're doing. Uh, on the other hand, it can also hinder other companies. So, um, and this is another way to look at patents as a way to, to share what you're doing, to protect and hinder, uh, not pr protecting per se, but uh, uh, frightening other uh, small uh, companies from joining uh, or, or trying what you're doing. Doing the same, okay. Uh, uh, Ilya, what would you have to say about this, which is yeah, in your thank you. department is very important. Yes, um, okay. this is really, this is the integral part of, of technology transfer um, and really it's, the patents are the basis of, of everything that we do. Not everything, but I would say 90% of what we do. Because without patents, without having a patent position, you, don't, the, you can't find an investor and investors aren't going to look for, for a company that doesn't have some sort of a, um, a foot on, on the ground and some sort of a, mo a monopoly. Because what is a patent in essence? A, a patent in essence gives gives you a monopoly for about 20 years all over the world. And in that time frame, you're gonna have to commercialize your technology and in some cases get regulation for it. But so there's a lot of, there's a lot of costs involved for the company, for the investors um, who are going to put their money into the company. And they wanna know that you're the only company in the world that could monetize on that invention. So if you come up with something that's not patentable, it's going to be very difficult to find investors, um, especially in the, you know, these type of, in, in, in technologies that you need patents. And of course, there's technologies that you don't need patents. For example, you know, um, different types of software, right? You don't need it. But when you're talking about um, things that we can touch, 
um, it's best to have a patent if you're going to want to find investors or want to uh, put money down. Um, and like I said, most of most of our most of our licenses from coming from the university have patents. We do have licenses that deal with know-how, so it's not something that can be patented. For example, if you have some sort of a protocol for for growing a plant of some sort or or, or increasing the yield of, of something. Um, by using a protocol or having cells differentiate uh, in, in a specific way. It, you're not necessarily going to patent it. It be might be best to keep it as a trade secret. And then we would have a, a license for the know-how. But it's very hard to, it, it's much easier to, to find investors when you have a patent. Um, it, uh, another another question for you, Ilya, and then I, I will go to the, the two entrepreneurs. Uh, scientific entrepreneurs is um, from from patents and licenses. Do you get uh, does the university get uh, an economic return that is significant enough for the investment that the university does in basic and the government? No, when you said the government invests, I was almost two billion a year in 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 in, in, in innovation and investigation and all kinds of things. Does that money come back to, to the university? What you invest in, in all these uh, inventions? So really it's, yeah, it's two different questions because the, the 2 billion that we spoke about earlier is, is money that the government in, invests into the ecosystem. So that yeah. doesn't all come you know, to the university. That goes to the companies the, and it's, it, it uh, creates jobs and, and brings in funding from outside afterwards, you know, uh, into the companies and cre creates a lot of it creates an ecosystem. So 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 we're, we're not we're not talking about the, the two billion. What we're talking about what is, you receive is and what you invest yeah, at yeah. the university. So, so so if you look at technology transfer companies worldwide, the truth is most of them um, don't make money and and are 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 losing money. Uh, there are very few that are breaking even and there's even fewer that actually make money in the long term uh it making as a technology transfer company it, there's up, ups and downs so so when you have when you, most most of the deals that you make in the end of the day uh it could be spin outs that that don't make money um there could be uh licenses that you give to big companies that don't turn into project and you know turn into uh licensable turn into um, commercial products but the university sees does the university does see money from this you know the sale of, of big companies so for example when we have these unicorns that get sold um we have shares in those companies so over there the university gets you know has their share of of uh profits and that's what funds the technology transfer company for for, me, for, me, for years forward um, and building and continuing the innovation so any any license that we do has several different components and really this is a, a webinar all in of itself um, and there's a lot of material online that you can find about it but when we license our technologies there's different components there is, if it's going to be to a spin out startup company, so we have uh, shares in that company, of equity in that company. Um, there's also like license component where if, if there's, there's royalties involved, so when they actually start selling it, but there's also milestones that could be, that could be added to the license. So if they reach some sort of proof of concept or raise a certain amount of money, they pay back to the university. And, and that, that money gets split up. Um, at least in at Hebrew University, and I think in Tel Aviv University, it's the same formula, but it varies from different universities around the world. And that's that when, when money comes in from uh, considerations of, uh, of either royalties or milestones, that's usually split up uh, 40, 20, 40. So 40% 40 goes to the inventor, 20% goes to the labs of the inventor, and 40% goes to the university. So. Okay. So that's how that's how the you know that's how the money is split up when it comes in. But the, in addition to that, the university sees money not from actual sales of those products, but from sponsored research, which is very important to the university, because at least in in Israel, um, 
it's actually matched. And not a lot of people know this, but sponsored research, let's say a company comes and sponsors $100,000 of research uh, at the university, it's actually, that money is actually doubled because the government then gives you another $100,000 um, because to the university itself. So there's a lot of money being uh, given by the government. Um, so the university sees it on both ends, both in the sponsored research, funding students, teaching students, um, having them graduate, and also uh, sees, sees monetary uh, considerations if the project is successful. Okay. Thank you very much. And then both to, to Miron and, and Tal, um, I see that uh, climate change is, is a great uh, catalyst of your uh, companies because you uh, increase yield and you are trying to what was done uh, synthetically uh, to now uh, introduce natural processes. And uh, how do you see, uh, what I was surprised in both cases is that perhaps The, the wood industry that you work in, Miron, is not in Israel, and many of the cosmetics and, and, uh, and food and, and pharmaceuticals that, that uh, you work on, Tal, or that are your clients are not there, or the plantations for the products. Um, how do you relate, you know, to introduce uh, these, uh, these developments to industries and farming land that is is not in Israel, you know, it's like a mindset that is very surprising to us in Argentina. Um, uh, Miron, why don't you start first? Climate change and how you relate to these industries and, and, and farmland that are not in your, in your so, country. So, so again, if we're talking about climate change, this is, not, this is not a buzzword. This is the reality because again, we are part of a larger company that plant again, 1.5 million hectares of trees. Um, and we see a constant increase in pest infestation, drought, um, decrease in, in, in tree volume due to these issues. So we need to face that. One of the things that uh, I honestly, I, I must say that uh, it came to our mind uh, a few years back even before we saw these, uh, these issues, is that we are going to see a shift in uh, insect and pest diseases coming from different parts of the world. And we started working on that even before we, <laughs> we uh, put our step uh, in uh, Brazil. Um, so, and the solutions you don't really need to be in this specific climate to test. Uh, as we saw, even the, the beginning of the, the movie uh, that we saw in the beginning, you can test uh, in different environments, in controlled labs, in controlled greenhouses. We in Israel have a unique uh, set of weather. Uh, we have drought, we have drip irrigation, if you want to copy or phenocopy the, the, the more humid, or more uh, um, irrigated areas. And above all, uh, when we look at the solutions, we take everything out to the field. We are testing in a real environment and you can decide where you test it. You uh, just, again, to copy the real area uh, that you'll be delivering the technology to. So again, I think, um, And this is something that you learn in the, again, the Hebrew University uh, to improvise, to, to think outside the box, uh, to how to implement things that you cannot do uh, when, when you're in, a, you know, with a bigger country or in Israel. Uh, but everything again goes, everything that's successful here goes outside to Brazil. And we are testing it also in the in Brazilian soil. So after it's finalized the proof of concept here in Israel, we are going to Brazil and uh, taking, look, uh, taking a look at the technology over there. Okay. Tal, your startup was, was, was uh, climate change um, a factor that really uh, made you think of all these uh, advanced solutions? Of course. And I, all the sustainability aspects are 
And I, I, I can really agree with the, what Miron said about the, the environment, but also business-wise, Israel is a startup nation. And, and for, for that, we got ventures from all around, uh, from all of the, over the world. And therefore, we, we are handling uh, troubles or challenges from not only Israel, um, got challenges all over the world and, uh, and our technology and minds here uh, are uh, great to handle with, uh, with these uh, problems. And you find that the industries are willing the, uh, to, to pay for this, uh, for this advanced development. You know, instead of growing crops in, in, uh, and, uh, in old way, old fashioned to introduce these trans transgenic plants. And the, the, the industry, the first day, they need, need new solutions. Because okay. like the climate change, and you said it, you said it also, and sustainability issues are the, like in top of the line, top of the line in, uh, in the troubles in, uh, of, the, of these companies and what they're looking for, the solution they, that they're looking for. Uh, so yes, uh, GMO okay. is a, a very good way to handle these problems and to attack these uh, challenges. Okay, Ilya, uh, one question from the public is, how uh, can one uh, invest to be incubated in, in Yisum? Or how, how does, uh, or you decide uh, to incubate a, a company there and, 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 and do the investment? So, so if we're looking from the technology perspective or from the inventor perspective, I'll try to answer from both sides. So how if it's- can, a, how, how, do, how can you invest in, in, uh, in Yisum to be incubated? That's the question. But I guess uh, uh, it's how do you decide to invest or if somebody wants to be incubated, both things. Well, yeah, let me, as a, it's a little bit unclear, but let me try to, let me try to answer from both sides. So if it, so if we look, if we have technology that's developed at, at, um, at the university, we try to look and see if it's a platform technology that can be used for different things in which case then we can spin out a company um, that will be able to, to deal with all, that whole platform. Um, but sometimes we choose to divide it up and, and try to license it into specific fields to, to big companies that already exist. Um, if we're looking to, for, if we're looking for investment, um, so investors want to, to get in touch with us. First of all, we have a website that has all the different technologies. Um, all the different technologies that are available right now to license, you know, available to license. So they can take a look there and there's a contact person there for, so in Yusum, we're also, I didn't go into this, to the structure of Yusum, but we're divided in different verticals. So I deal with ag tech, food tech, veterinary. We have uh, two other people that deal with life sciences and medical sciences. We have somebody else that's dealing with um, business development in, in you know, computer sciences. So each one has a different field. So get in touch with us uh, if you see something that you like, or if you don't see something there, uh, you can also get in touch with us and, and ask about a particular field. And, and we'll, be, uh, put, we'll put you in touch with, with a researcher that can help you. Okay, very good. Miron, there's a question if uh, Futura Gene is, uh, uses this technology in other kinds of trees. Are you thinking of applying it in an other industry, not only eucalyptus? This is a good question. I mean, if it depends what technology we are talking about. Um, if you are looking at uh, yield and wood quality, yes, so it should, it should work in other trees. And we tested in the past uh, some of the technologies in other crops, other trees, as also mentioned, I think, in my talk, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, Cervateria uh, crop, if you look at the insect resistance, so this is really tailor-made uh, because there are specific insects and pests that attack eucalyptus, and we are we are we have a feeding lab, so we we are testing different material uh, and how it impacts uh, our insects. Mm -hmm. But uh, and we are not giving any kind of uh, service, but but definitely anyone that needs. Uh, uh, needs help or looking for a solution, 
can contact us and uh, we can try to tailor to, to, to tailor made a, a solution for for him uh, or she um, regarding herbicide resistance this is more general I think uh, you can use it for for any other crop um, again most of the technologies were tested also in other trees uh, in our hands and some other in with other companies, other uh, institutes. Okay. Um, what you're in a startup phase, Tal? What do you What do you know? You you received the investment, but what do you What is the next phase for your company? Okay. So, like I said uh, in my presentation, we we are now in development stage, uh, but but we have almost ready to market the uh, product already. Uh, we still need to, to have the regulation uh, phase. Some of them it depends on the country, of course. Um, and that's where we are. To, we are expanding our portfolio of, of, of compounds and, uh, and also uh, plants that we work on. Um, and we have already, we started the collaboration with the ingredient companies. Okay. And, and uh, Ilya, Ilya, there's a question. Uh, what are the, the requisites to receive uh, subsidies from the state? Do you also apply to subsidies from, from government? Yeah, the, the Israel government has different funding opportunities for researchers. Um, some of them involve being with a company. So they apply to, we apply together. And some of them, um, we don't need a company. There are different programs involved. Um, so usually, usually the government provides, you know, 80 or 90% of the funding for the research program and the, and the industry partner provides 10 to 20% of the, and, and then together we apply for it. Okay. And, and to, uh, to, to f close up, one question for the three of you. You, uh, you mentioned the term bioeconomy. Uh, what do you understand by bioeconomy, uh, which I think is, is larger than the future of agriculture only, but it's very correlated. So uh, I think uh, this, this new concept is very important to understand the potential of all that comes from, from farm link, farming and farmland and, and that nature and the production of nature. Uh, how, would you like, Ilya, since you're on screen right now and then Miron and, and Tal, <laughs> or whoever oh. wants. To, to so I, I didn't I didn't use the term bioeconomy, but I think I think what it means is uh, that it's a it's a circular economy that we don't that we that we don't uh, create a lot of pollution and a lot of waste and everything that we that we create we can then um, create to something else and that it's it's circular and it's disposable and it's biodegradable and it's you know all of these these words that 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 we've been hearing the last uh, decade or so. Uh, bringing this type of technology, you know, for example, we have uh, one technology where where we're talking about uh, biodegradable packaging, right? So, so packaging nowadays involves a lot of plastic and styrofoam and things like that, and that's that's not a bioeconomy. That's a wasteful economy, where we take okay. a resource from the ground and then we have to bury it somewhere uh, when we throw out our package. So, we we have something that's that that creates a biodegradable uh, solution for, for packaging. And that, that's, that's a, that's a bioeconomy example. But the raw materials are biological. Yeah, okay. biological raw materials. And then the, afterwards, after a certain amount of time, they break down and go back to the nature. Miron, how would you define, since you were the first one or the one who used it, I think. <laughs> so, so I will add just another layer to what Elia answered. Um, it's, you can, <laughs> So you can define it also as a circular economy, where you take, for example, again, you take our trees. It's it's like a factory that you don't need to use any more other uh, um, other products that come out of fossil fuel. So from tree, for example, you can use it for 
paper, tissues, textile, uh, construction, packaging. Uh, there are many studies in, if you look at Scandinavia, so there are many studies looking at, at fibers for a, a replacement for carbon fibers, filters, any type, anywhere in your life uh, that you can use something, something that is renewable and sustainable and, and grow outside without even, I mean, we, for example, we use only once or twice in a cycle, we use he, uh, fertilizers. So, uh, and if we can uh, replace all the fossil based products with this type of renewable materials uh, in a circular way, that you can use every part of the tree for everything up to food, even goes up to go to protein, for example. Mm -hmm. Which is another 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 interesting uh, industry that is on the rise. So this is my definition for a bioeconomy, circular economy. Tal, <laughs> yeah. if you speak about bioeconomy, or you speak about everything that we uh, that we have here in the, in our health. Uh, may want to speak about trees and but it's also food and energy and every touch it touches all all of us like me once said uh, um, i think that our goal is to it is to be uh, to, to our economy and be more sustainable and not not to use uh, the fossil uh, uh, based uh, products at all or, or mm -hmm. uh, less of them yes. and uh, yeah more green okay well thank you to all of three three it was wonderful i'm sure it's a great beginning for the conference that continues tomorrow and um, um i really hope that a lot of alliances between israel and argentina uh, and the countries that are listening to this the conference will take place and uh, marisa bergman will be uh, giving for the, the, the final words and thank you so much. It was fascinating. Muchísimas gracias, María Eugenia. Muchas gracias a todos por ser parte de este webinar. En esta jornada hemos eh, tenido el orgullo desde la Organización de los Amigos Argentinos de poder reunir a ISUM, el órgano responsable de estructurar la transferencia tecnológica de la universidad, como venimos hablando en este espacio y proyectarla mundialmente junto con dos pujantes empresas como Pigmentum y Futura G. Tal como hemos visto hoy, se presentaron investigaciones que surgieron en los laboratorios de la Universidad de Hebrea, que gracias a esta articulación lograron un impacto de gran alcance para toda la humanidad. Y en particular ilustraron también a través de sus investigaciones, y es lo que vimos a través también de, de las respuestas sobre las preguntas que fueron surgiendo, cómo el Estado de Israel se ha transformado de una startup nation a una impact nation, y su impacto en el mundo entero sobre estos avances. Gracias a la Embajada de Israel, de quien recibimos el apoyo constante en nuestras actividades, y muy especialmente... Agradecer a Ilia, a Mirón y a Tal, que han compartido generosamente su saber con nuestra audiencia, y a María Eugenia Estensoro, muy especialmente, gracias María por haber enriquecido este encuentro con tu presencia. Adama, sponsor de este webinar, mañana nos vamos a volver a encontrar con un, papel, con un panel perdón, integrado por Raquel Chan, Claudio Dunan y Fernando Vilela, a las 10 de la mañana, y a todos aquellos que les hayan quedado eh, preguntas o comentarios, eh, pueden escribirnos en el mismo mail donde ustedes eh, se inscribieron para participar del webinar, así seguiremos en contacto eh, con cada uno de los que nos escriban. Muchísimas gracias a todos, gracias a Karen y a Claudia por la maravillosa eh, traducción que nos hicieron a todos. Eh, y nos vemos mañana. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Gracias por estar. <música>